As a production designer, what are some of the first few things you do when you first sign on with a job? When I first sign on to a job, well, I've usually read the script and met with the director. So th those were the preliminary things. And often when I, um, if it's a director I haven't worked with before, I make a presentation to show them of, um, at my meeting, my first meeting with them before I have the job, of my sort of visual concept for the movie. Um, and with Todd, I've worked with Todd before, so I, I didn't have to do that. And um, so I'm, when I met with, should I talk about when I met with Todd specifically? Sure, you can, yeah. Absolutely. I met with Todd specifically. It was myself and Ed Lockman, the cinematographer who I've worked with before, and Sandy Powell, the costume designer. And we all met in New York, where I live. And um, Todd kind of, we had a long discussion about the general feeling that he was trying to go for in Carol. And we talked a lot about the period of 1952 in New York City and how it wasn't really the bright, sunny 1950s that people usually think of, mid-century modern period, but it was this darker post-war period. So that was one of the most important things we talked about. And then we talked about um, Saul Leiter, the photographer, and some other photographers who had been photographing New York at that time, and the looks that they had achieved in their photographs and how we were going to emulate some of their elements in the look of the movie. Um, and from there, um, there's a few things that I do when I start a movie, and they're sort of going on at the same time. Um, I start location scouting, and um, that's a huge part of the movies I work on because um, some of them have very big builds, but they always have a lot of locations. And, um, and at the same time, I'm assembling a wall, a big wall, of re re visual reference um, that sort of shows what I think is the look of the movie and of research, um, the specific research. So for a period movie, there's a lot of specific research that has to be done. What color were fire hydrants in New York in 1952? They were black, by the way, but I didn't know that. So this is the kind of thing that, you know, it's all this trivia, but you have to know it to make a realistic looking movie. So you have the visual reference and the research. And the third thing that is important for the beginning of my process is to have, is to figure out the color palette of the movie. So I myself have a large collection of vintage paint decks and um, paint chips, and I bring that to every movie I work on, not, not just period ones. And um, so we looked at the paint chips from the 40s and the 30s and the early 50s, and picked out a sort of range of colors that we wanted to work with. And then I had my charge scenic, Pat Sprott, uh, who came with me from New York to Cincinnati, do a lot of color samples, um, two, by four, two by two color samples, which we lined up around the room. And at the same time, my set decorator, Heather Leffler, was getting fabric samples that we matched with the color samples. So we sort of had a Therese's apartment section and a Carol's house section and all the different motels um, section and the toy store. So we're kind of creating little pieces of all the different worlds that you can actually walk into the art department and, and get an idea of what the movie's gonna look like in the, in the sense of the color palette. Are you assembling a color palette and a mood based on a time period most instances or a character's mood and sort of who they are. Both, mm. both. So in a period movie, or you know, you're starting with the time period because you, you need to have period accuracy in order to let the viewer forget about the fact that they're watching a period movie, but you don't want anything to draw them out of that period in a sense. So they're watching a movie. It takes place in 1952, and there's something that looks not quite right over there. And even if they're not consciously noticing it, subconsciously, it may distract them for a moment. So I really try hard to create a very, um, as accurate a world as possible so that then everyone can forget about it and focus on the story. Is it ultimately, we, all of us craftspeople want people to focus on the story and the characters and not you know, the costume or the sofa or the walls or the fire hydrant, but really on the characters. So, um, so first you're starting with what did New York look like? It looked like this. What is our particular New York going to look like? You know, which aspects of that New York are we choosing to put in that in our movie? And finally, what do our characters' worlds look like within that context? So, in 1952, in the Far East Side of Manhattan, 
what would Therese, this character's apartment, have looked like? So it's, it's kind of a, a process of getting from, going from the big picture down to the small picture. How much do you pay attention to tiny details? I noticed in the film, you know, she was an aspiring uh, photographer. So you'd see some, you know, photos on her thing, but it was very sort of sparse in other places. Yes, I mean, I pay a lot of attention to detail. It's, um, everyone that works with me knows that I do. Um, so I know that there are designers who give, a, you know, almost sort of don't get that involved with set dressing at all, for example, and their set decorator does their own thing and the designer's doing something else, but I, and their prop master, but I, I work with a lot of people I've worked with before. I have a very great team of people that I've worked with over and they all know that, you know, I'm going to get involved and I, and I do, but it, we have a great collaboration. So I pay attention to everything, everything that I can. And I'm upset if there's something I missed, it always happens, you know, but, um, so uh, any negative space that you saw, for example, on a wall or any sparseness that was definitely planned. Oh. Was there um, a particular location that was a little more challenging to decide on how to present it? Um, well, the toy store, wa the toy department, was a department in a department store, was a huge, a huge set for us in terms of the work that it required. And, and it's also the opening, kind of, not the opening set of the movie, but one a, a big important set because it's where Therese meets Carol. And, um, and you, you want this kind of this whole world to, to be created in a believable fashion. So it was, it took us, um, it was a while before we found the right location for that. And um, we went through a lot of different options. We scouted some, uh, we were in Cincinnati and there were some towns outside of Cincinnati that had closed down department stores that were built in the right era and this was so exciting and we went and scouted them and they were all wrong. I mean one of them had been too remodeled in the 1960s and another one was too small and another one um, they wouldn't let us shoot there and it wasn't that great anyway so we were kept going through all these different options and it was starting to be a little scary and then we found this great um, abandoned high school, uh, turn, of the turn of the 20th century high school that had this gymnasium that was had beautiful out details because we, we really just needed walls, floor, ceiling, columns, and we were going to create the rest. So this gymnasium looked good. It had a little running track, and we were going to make a mezzanine up there with toys, which I had seen in, in much of the period research. And the building had no heat or water at the moment or no electricity. And we started to, they started to make a deal with the owner, and then it it fell through, it became too expensive. He started asking for more money. I don't even know what happened, but suddenly we had no location and we really had nothing. And then my decorator, Heather Leffler said, I've been shopping at this fabric store, Mill End, and they have a, it's a multi-floor building and I think maybe one of the floors would be good for the toy department. So we went and looked, it was a big storage floor and it was filled with junk. I mean, just covered, but we knew it was the right place like, right away. And um, immediately we, we brought Todd and he loved it and we surveyed it and started clearing it out. And um, so that was, that was the beginning of the toy department. Now you began doing production design in 1992. Is that when your first job was or? That might've been the first movie I designed, but, right, but then there was a long gap in between that and my next one because I, it was when I started working in the film business, which I think was 1989, um, it was very, easy to, in a way, to get jobs as a production designer. I just fell into that job. It wasn't, I didn't know if I wanted to do it. And right after that sublet, I decorated a movie and I, I kind of was, didn't know what I was doing. Then I became a set dresser. So it was a kind of, for me, not very di well directed period. And then I took a break and did something else for four years. And I came back to the film business and I knew I wanted to be a production designer. It just was this revelation in me. and I. I can't explain it, had no basis in anything. And it, at that point, had become a very popular, this was 1997, had become a very popular job. And a lot of people wanted to do it. And people I had known when they were interns were suddenly production designers. So I thought it would be easy, but it took three years of working really, really hard and just like constantly tr going for jobs and being rejected and, and a lot of rejection before I, I finally got a couple of movies in a row and I made the decision like now I'm a production designer, it was the year 2000 and I'm not going to do anything else and that was when my career really started. 
sound like you needed those four years to find out maybe what you didn't want and then yes uh -huh. exactly it was great <laughs> I don't regret it because it really showed me what I wanted and sometimes you know you never know what's going to show you that in life Sure. Well, starting out for someone today, since it's much more competitive, yes. what would you recommend? Would you recommend, of course, interning and then how would someone prove that they were worthy of promoting? Um, yes, I would recommend interning and I'd recommend working as a PA. Um, and I'd recommend, there's, well, I think that one thing I've noticed is that there's so many things. But I'm trying to think of what to say first. You have to know that it's the right thing for you. So in that sense, I mean, you have to be willing to work very long hours. You have to be willing to, um, it's a tough business and there's a lot of hierarchy and there's a lot of personalities and you have to be able to cope with that. You can't be too sensitive, you know, and it's hard. That's a, that's a learning curve. Um, you have to be patient. I think you should always be working below your skill level. I think that working, you know, at a level at, at which you're not really um, qualified for is just going to be a bit mistake in your career. And I, I made that mistake. I took a job as a prop master. I didn't know what I was doing. I got fired, you know, and it taught me a lesson. So I think you should always be aware of that you should always be kind of more prepared for than you than you should be for the job. Um, I think a lot of people just out of college are impatient. I don't blame them. They want to get started. They want to be this or that. But I think there's so much to learn and you should make your mistakes when no one's going to see them. I mean, I designed student movies. I designed a student movie that took place in 1968 and I filled it with every piece of kitsch from 1968 that I could think of. You know, if I would never do that now as a designer, and I did that on a student movie that nobody ever saw, and I'm glad I got that out of my system. So you're going to make mistakes. Make them when nobody's watching. Um, don't make them when someone's watching and, uh, and might not hire you the next time. So I think patience, hard work, ambition, n not taking, you know, not being too sensitive, those are just character traits, and they're really important for this business. And then on top of that, you know, watch a lot of movies and look at a lot of art and look at a lot of photography and know what you're talking about. Because it's not just about design. It's about cinema. I mean, to me, it's about cinema and it's about designing a movie. It's not about designing a set. So the directors I meet with, they want to talk about other movies. You know, they don't want to talk about building a set. And I think that that's the most important thing um, for any of us working at a creative level in this business is we're working on movies and whatever kinds of movies we want to work on you know everybody's got their things some people want to do superhero movies and some people want to do low budget period movies and some people want to do romantic comedies everybody or fantasy movies it's you know everybody's got their thing that they want to do but know that know that genre that you're working in or know that that group of films because all films inform the next film that comes along and and you have to love it. So it's, you know, everything that I do in my life is really related to my work and I can't really separate it. When I go on vacation, I'm taking photographs of signs that I might use as research in a movie and I enjoy it. It's not like I turn it off because I'm done with my job. It's ongoing and um, it's worth it, but you have to love it. I wanted to go back to the student film that you referenced just a little bit ago and you said you filled it with everything from that time period. Yeah. Why was that bad? Was that overkill? It was overkill because in, at no point in history ever, unless maybe in a hotel room like we are right now, um, is everything from the same time period. In a domestic interior, there's layers of things. So you have furniture that was inherited from somebody's parents, or you have something they bought 10 years ago. You have a new copy of a magazine. You have some old glasses that were bought at a flea market. I'm just giving examples, but if you think about you know almost any interior that's been lived in for more than six months represents many time periods. And in this case, that film was about a family's house. And um, that family had had that house for a while. So it would have been crazy for everything to have been from the year in which the, the movie took place. It just wouldn't be realistic. And there are, for sure, period movies, serious period movies that are designed that way. And it's just... Um, it can be fun for viewers, you know, because it's like, oh, look at that fridge and look at that this. And, but I don't think it's a very accurate representation of the period, and I think it's a little distracting. When you talk about layers, I like that. Um, 
let's suppose someone is in a situation and their life is more in turmoil, but then you see that their home is so well put together. Like maybe, Carol? <laughs> well, yeah. but, but that sort of embodied who she was, yeah, and I yeah, get that. Yeah, yeah. But, but there's been other movies. Do you ever fight to maybe mess it up a little? Someone sort of that put a little more chaos in the way they're living because it just seems a little too perfect for who the character is? Or? Well, yeah, I mean, I don't tend to like, I mean, I think that that was a very appropriate setting for Carol because she also has help. Yes, get, you know very she's not cleaning it up herself, <laughs> so that house is not going to be too messy. But um, she's very wealthy. But um, yes, I think that I don't tend to like things to be too pretty because they don't tend to look that way in real life, whether they're period or contemporary. So um, I like a bit of chaos, and I like a bit of messiness, and I like a dangling electrical cord. You know, especially something that takes place in New York. I designed the pilot for girls, and I was very based that a lot on my own experience of living in bad apartments in New York. And, um, and I made sure to put a lot of those elements in, many of which are gone now. Um, but um, so that kind of thing is important to me. I think it shows, it makes the place seem real as opposed to artificial, um, an, an artificial movie set versus reality.